I don't want to disappoint you. I <coughs> hope it will be acceptable to you what I will do. We will come at this point, because I don't want to repeat myself only in the second class, what I will try to do after some sort of political introduction is more and more I try to do something maybe crazy. I'm trying to stop with this postmodern game of, you know, taking one philosopher through the eyes of another philosopher and being brighter than both. <laughs> I try to approach, uh, you know, how much of today's philosophy still is uh, a th philosophy without position. And once Alain you told me, I have great appreciation for Jacques Derrida, that he spoke with Derrida, and that, that Derrida simply admitted to him that he is not able simply to say things are like this, I think. It has to be just, if you read this text, even better. If you see how this text is reading another text, you can see some, uh, some, some cuts, some inconsistencies, and so on and so on. While not uh, ignoring the results of such deconstructive reading, I think that we should take a risk and return to this very naive questions, not in a naive way. I mean, fuck it, like, what is reality? Is it meaningful to talk about reality? Do things exist outside our mind? Can we talk about things in themselves? If yes, how, and so on and so on, all this stuff. Of course, I'm not advocating in the, in the sense of new so-called speculative realism, some simple return to big claims, realities out there, and so on. But it is a problem. And the way I decided to approach it, at least I will not repeat myself too much, is uh, not in a strict mathematical sense, but nonetheless, to progress at this towards this big question through late Lacan's topology. Don't be afraid. No formulas. I will just focus on, and don't be afraid, I will show them, explain everything in the lowest Wikipedia way. Uh, you know these three basic forms. Medium uh, strip, cross cap, and uh, climb bottom. I think that we can learn quite a great, a great deal from simply reflecting what does it mean to take, of course, as a formal level, these figures as an ontological clue, as a clue to how our reality is structured. But as it is usual with me, I will uh, begin with a short political reflection, which will then bring us to this topic. Okay, so let me begin. As you may have noticed, lately our media report on the more and more ridiculous exchange of insults between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. The, the situation I find very ironic. Because we get what appears to be two immature men letting go their rage and hurling insults at each other. And what we secretly hope is that there must be some anonymous, invisible, institutional constraint preventing their rage to explode in full war. What I like is this, that our usual reaction is the following, is the opposite one. Usually, we tend to complain that in today's alienated, bureaucratized politics, institutional pressures and constraints prevent politicians to articulate their personal vision to do what they really want. Now, we go the exact opposite. Let's hope there is some alienated, invisible, 
deep structure that will prevent these two madmen to do it. Okay, how did we come to this point? I already developed it uh, uh, time uh, developed it time ago. This, uh, uh, that it's uh, this uh, Espadieu developed it in his uh, one of his last books. What is happening today? Uh, in our growing post-patriarchal social order, which presents itself as the domain of new freedoms, we witness the disintegration of shared ethical base of our lives. And I agree with Miller, who, uh, sorry, with Badiou, who even claims that one of the dark signs of this is the abolishment of universal military conscription. Now, this may appear to be good news for all uh, pacifists and so on, but are you aware what this basically means? It means, uh, it, of course, it means mercenaries will fight for us. I mean, I am absolutely for, if you ask me, global military conscription. Are you aware that this is the reason why Vietnam War ended? Because without military conscription, the poor blacks and others would be fighting it. But because there was military conscription, and all those young white kids had actually to risk their lives, there was such pressure against it. All honest leftists admit it. <coughs> uh, what I'm uh, trying to say is that, I'm repeating but you and myself here, this ethical disintegration affects differently the two sexes. Men are gradually turning into perpetual adolescents with no clear passage of initiation that would enact their entry into maturity. Uh, no wonder then that in order to supplant this lack, post-paternal youth gangs proliferate, providing some ersatz initiation and social identity. And, now comes the more problematic point, in contrast to men, women are today more and more precociously mature, treated as small adults, expected to control their lives, and so on and so on. So in this new version of sexual difference, men are ludic adolescents, outlaws, while women appear as much more mature, serious, legal, punitive. Uh, and uh, this brings us back to Trump and Kim. These two eternal adolescents, both prone to irrational, brutal outbursts that hurt their own senses. Although the differences between North Korea and the United States are obvious, one should nonetheless insist that they both cling to the extreme version of state sovereignty. Korea first versus America first. Plus that, the obvious madness of North Korea, a small country ready to strike, to risk it all and bomb the United States, or so they claim, because my, the most relaxed people today are my friends in Seoul, who take all this as a joke and claim it's absolutely not to be taken seriously and so on. But nonetheless, this North Korean madness has its counterpart in the United States, which still pretend to play the role of the global policeman, a single state assuming the right to decide which other state should be allowed to possess nuclear weapons. So I think the solution is not to just crash North Korea, but to find a genuine way of internationalizing nuclear weapons to make the situation when a single sovereign state is allowed to possess them, illegal, unacceptable. The moment we just focus on the madness of North Korea, we endorse the premise that they should not be allowed to do what only the selected superpowers can do. So I think again that the problem is this entire constellation, as long as we will have states which not only do have nuclear weapons, but assume the role of allowing to deciding who of the others will have them or not, we will have North Korea's all around. Now uh, comes the more interesting theoretical point. Uh, this urge to change the entire constellation, 
emerges precisely when we are confronting a threat of total destruction. And we are today confronting it by nuclear war, by ecological catastrophe, and so on. In such a situation, our first reaction is a defensive effort to guarantee our survival. If nuclear war is at the horizon or total ecological catastrophe, the message we usually hear is, now is the time to forget big emancipatory projects of radical change. Our task is now just to fight for the survival of what we have, with all the compromises and moderation that such a task involves. But here comes a much more refined counter-argument that I openly admitted I plagiarized from my good friend and theoretical partner, Alenka Zubancic. But what is it that we have? The threat of the total destruction of humanity makes us aware of the totality of humanity. Humanity appears as one only against the background of its self-destruction. It was not here before. So the true choice is not the one between what we have and losing it all, or in the Cold War terms, between developing nuclear arms to protect our liberal freedoms, or abandoning nuclear arms and thereby exposing ourselves to the risk of losing our freedoms. I will quote now, so what is our choice? I quote, listen carefully, Alenka Zubanjic. The true choice is between losing it all, in a nuclear or ecological catastrophe, and creating what we are about to lose. Only this could eventually save us. <coughs> when caught in the threat and fear of losing it all, we are in fact held hostages to something that does not exist yet. And is this kind of blackmail not actually the very means of making sure that it will never exist? It makes us focus on preserving what is here and what we have, but excludes any real alternative, uh, any means of really thinking differently. So, the possible awakening call of the bomb is not simply, let's do all in our power to prevent it before it's too late, but rather, let's first build this totality, unity, community, freedom, that we are about to lose through the bomb. End of quote. And I think here we can locate the unique chance opened up by the very real threat of nuclear or ecological self-destruction. It makes us aware of the danger that we will lose it all. But when we become aware of this, we, I claim, and in a good sense, automatically get caught in some kind of retroactive illusion, a short circuit between reality and its hidden potentials. What we want to say when we say, let's just say what can be saved, is not the reality of our world, but reality as it might have been if we were not hindered by antagonisms which gave birth to the nuclear threat. So you see what I'm saying, that when we feel threatened that we will lose it all. This all changes in a subtle way. It's an illusion, but it's a good illusion, if I put it like this. This all, in a subtle way, is no longer our reality. It's this all which is threatened immediately acquires a utopian content. This all that we want to protect we have to change it radically in order to be able to protect it. So it's a nice example of how the most radical change is demanded just to, uh, 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 just to protect uh, what we have. The true utopianism today is precisely not a radically different uh, utopianism in a good sense of the term. It's not just uh, uh, oh, we need a totally different world, but what we have to do 
just to protect what we have. Because again, the moment you want to protect it, you have radically to change it radically. What kind of epistemology is involved now in slowly approaching Matthew Street in this type of retroactive illusion? I want to go back to Plato here. I hope I don't have to uh, uh, tell you the entire story. You know it, Plato's cave, no? I want us to focus on something, and here I'm referring to another friend of mine who I appreciate very much, Frank Ruda, who was here, the German guy, who recently developed some wonderful plans on it. And you will see now how to appoint my dark totalitarian side, whatever. You will see how right was that crazy guy, Roger Scruton, who saw very clearly the madness and violence, whatever, of my belief. Namely, uh, Plato's cave. Uh, there is one aspect of, it's already in Plato, which is usually neglected. This concerns the relationship between freedom and servitude. It's not simply that when we are in the cave, just watching shadows, false reality on the wall, that we are chained there, we are not free. Plato asks the crucial question, and I think it's the duty of the left to assume it fully. Namely, it's not just the, chain, the chains that keep us there. Read carefully the Republic. Plato says, but what will happen if we break the chains? People will not simply say, fine, we are free, let's run out of the cave. People will want spontaneously to remain there, even without chains. So, in some <coughs> sense, and I think this is the paradox that we have to assume fully, uh, and I know how this is usually considered a totalitarian formula. We have to be forced to be free. You need a master. If you are left to yourself, even without change, you will never get free. A quote from Frank Ruda. The exit from the cave begins when one of the prisoners is not only free from his chains, but when he is forced out. This clearly must be the place for the libidinal, but also epistemological, political, ontological function of the master. This can only be a master who does neither tell me what precisely to do, nor whose instrument I could become. He must be the one who just gives me back to myself. And in a sense, one might say that this could be connected to Plato's anamnesis theory, remembering what one never knew as it were, and implies that the proper master just affirms or makes it possible for me to affirm, to accept, I can do this, without telling me what this is, and thus without telling me too much of who I am. Again, so the idea is that very brutal, paradoxical one, that to become free, you have to be forced to be free, and this, for this, you need the figure of the master. But it's a paradoxical master. It's not an oppressive master who tells you what you want, and so on. It's a master whose message to you is just, you can do it. You are not just limited to what you are, and so on, and so on, you can do more. And I refer here to your very naive everyday experience. This master can be a good friend, a good teacher. Isn't it that when you are in crisis, you know you should do something, you don't have enough strength, and so on, and so on. A true master figure, a friend, a teacher, whatever. Uh, his message to you is just a very naive one. I know that you can do it. And he even doesn't have to know what. The point that Frank Ruda now <coughs> makes here is again a subtle one. It's not only that 
If I'm left to myself in a cave, even when I'm without chains, I prefer to stay there so that a master has to force me out. The situation is much more subtle. I have to, I know the madness of this formula, I have to volunteer to be forced out. <laughs> Similar to psychoanalysis, and this is the genius of Ruda. He draw a parallel with psychoanalytic situation where basically you volunteer to abdicate your conscious ego autonomy. But you must be a volunteer. You must volunteer to accept analysis as, of course, a very specific form of a master. So here I have another quote from Frank Ruda. A question arises at precisely this point from using the reference to the master in psychoanalytic terms. Does this mean that those who need a master are always already in the position of an analysant patient. If politically such a master is needed to, for us to become what we are, to use Nietzsche's formula, and this can be structurally linked to liberating the prisoner from the cave, <coughs> to force him out after the chains are broken, and he still does not want to leave, the question arises, how to link this with the idea that the patient, analysant, who demands for a psychoanalysis treatment, has to be a volunteer and not simply slave or bondsman. I mean, why am I mentioning this example? So that you see, I'm not involved in abstract um, uh, paradoxes. This happens precisely in a psychoanalytic situation. It is, to be brutal, a form of what La Boissy called servitude volontaire. So, in short, I quote back to Ruda, there must be a dialectics of master and volunteer. A dialectics because the master, to some extent, constitutes the volunteers as volunteers, liberates them from previously seemingly unquestionable position, so that they become voluntarily followers of the master's injunction, whereby the master ultimately becomes superfluous." End of quote. But, as uh, Frank Ruda is immediately aware, what complicates the picture is that, I quote Ruda, capitalism relies massively on unpaid and thereby structurally voluntary labor. There are thus volunteers and volunteers. So maybe one has to distinguish not only between different types of master figures, but also to link them to different understandings of the, of the volunteer. End of quote. Now I will try to explain this in very clear terms. We have here two levels of volunteering. They are different not only with regard to the content of servitude. In capitalism, I volunteer to become a servant of market mechanisms. In the second case, I become a volunteer to some emancipatory cause. The very form is different of volunteering. In capitalist servitude, we simply feel free, while in an authentic act of liberation, we accept voluntary servitude as serving a cause and not just serving ourselves. What do I mean by this? In today's cynical functioning of capitalism, I can know very well what I am doing and continue to do it. The liberating aspect of my knowledge is suspended. While in an authentic dialectics of liberation, the awareness of my situation is already the first step of liberation. In other words, in capitalism, I am enslaved precisely when I feel free. This feeling is the very form of my servitude. I'm not saying something obscure, dark, but a usual consumerist uh, subject. Let's say you are a consumerist precarious worker. You feel free. You do whatever you want, you sell yourself, you consume, but, of course, this 
doing what you want freely is the very form of your serving the existing system. While uh, in an emancipatory process, I am free when I feel as a slave. That is to say, the very feeling of being enslaved already bears witness to the fact that in the core of my subjectivity, I am free. You see the point one should here, or one could here, <coughs> introduce Lacan's distinction between enunciated, what I'm explicitly claiming, and what Lacan calls the position of enunciation, the position from which I speak in the everyday capitalist servitude voluntaire. I experience myself as free. The content of my existence is freedom. I consume, I choose the job that I want, and so on and so on. But the position from which I say this is already that of being enslaved to the existing system. Why? in an authentic emancipatory movement, the content of my statement, what I enunciate is, I am a slave. But by saying it, I already speak from a position of minimal freedom. Now, where is here, uh, where is here the, the Matthew said, ah, incidentally, if this was not clear, and I think we should fully assume at different levels, this idea that uh, the highest act of freedom is something done under pressure. You submit, you subject yourself to it. I'm still an old romantic and claim love. What is love? Personal, erotic love. Other than a form of very brutal and cruel servitude voluntaire. I accept to serve the man, the lady, and so on. And that's the paradox. So when you think I'm playing some cheap postmodern paradoxical games, no, I simply appeal to your experience. If you're fanatic in love, serving the guy, the lady, you don't experience it as simply serving as opposed to your freedom. You experience this directly as the highest form of your freedom. And, uh, uh, and it's the same in, in politics. The example that I often use here, your, your country, your political cause is in danger, and you decide to join this cause. You serve your cause, but you experience this as your utmost act of freedom. So again, what I'm just claiming is that the paradoxes that I'm trying to describe are not abstract conceptual jokes. They are part of our very intimate daily experience. How? When you feel free in your daily life, usually it means you are, and Plato saw this very clearly, it means you are simply fully enslaved to your, to your, to your, to your arbitrary passions and so on, and through them to the existing system and so on and so on. And I'm not afraid to say this. In a way, you have to be forced, awakened to be free. You need some, cause somebody has to push you into it uh, minimally. So uh, now we slowly approach my point. Where do we have here the Matthew's strip? You know, the basic structure, I will show it immediately, of Matthew's strip is, you know how it is twisted. You progress on one side. Oh my God, you have it here. I'm not sure. Okay, that's you know better than me. And, uh, 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 you progress on one side, you find yourself on the other side. Uh, again, I will show it immediately. This is what happens here. We don't simply have freedom serving you. If you go to the end in freedom and grasp freedom in this arbitrary way, free means I do, I do work for my pleasures, I do whatever I want, and so on and so on. You find yourself in servitude volunteer, serving the system. Well, on the other hand, uh, the other type of freedom 
highest freedom is again serving a cause, but again in a different way. But in both cases, you know, going, progressing on the side of freedom, you find yourself serving something, a cause or whatever. And this is the basic paradox to be, to be accepted. So we begin with, now I will just first show you and then I will describe them and maybe give you some hint, then we go on. You know what? Let's do it now, but, and yes, and I will, so that I, I will not, because it will give me a heart attack if I jump up and down and repeat it. Let's begin with this one. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> these are the three, and then I did something so humiliating from Wikipedia, <laughs> or you. I copied some So, this, the upper one, the green one, is, of course, the Medius strip. You see the point. You follow the land around, you find yourself at exactly the same place, but on the opposite side. Then, uh, next one, this crazy ball is the cross cat, which is, it will be explained immediately through a short movie presentation, which is the, <laughs> <coughs> can be topologically developed from a redoubled Medius strip. What's interesting here, I think it's a, perfect visualization of the minimal coordinates of an antagonistic totality, let's say class struggle. How? It appears to be a perfect ball, round form, but you see this is crucial. The down you have we have the line which is really a radical cut. The two sides are not clearly coordinated and so on and so on. It's like class struggle, if you want. And then, the most interesting one, my God, what you can develop from this one, <laughs> cross -head. Why is it so interesting? It is that up there, you fall in, and you make the turn, and you find yourself inside, on the opposite side. I will develop this later today, but mostly two days in detail, how this, I think, inside, being inside, looking at it, is Plato's scale. And this turn, you turn, it's precisely the turn of subjectivity. Okay, let's do now, so that you will get it, all these transformations. Let's, uh, let's do first this one. Let me show you some. Does it work? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you get from Mebius strip to cross cap?
don't be afraid, the shortest one on a Klein bottle. Okay, now I will do something totally crazy and jump to my last example. It's more amusing because I think I like it very much when you laughed a little bit. You were right, <laughs> especially in the last case of Klein Bottle. There is some undescribable, not clear, obscene eroticism. <laughs> <laughs> you have the feeling that something dirty is going on. <laughs> and okay, we will develop later what? But. Uh, this is just so that we get with this over. Then I will go into much more detail. So uh, I wonder, this is like now a small detour, because we do have a minimal <coughs> middle strip line, in the sense of you follow a certain direction, to the end you find yourself on the opposite side. It's a beautiful example from a movie which I don't know why, because it's a little bit simplistic, but uh, uh, it affected me deeply. Did you see the movie? I think it still plays in movie theaters. Uh, not Dunkirk. <laughs> <laughs> Wind River. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked it. Okay, it's a little bit simplistic and so on, but you know why I liked it? Because although it was done by a white man, uh, <coughs> Native Americans, Indians, whatever, for reasons well known, anti-racist reasons, I prefer the term uh, Indians. Because Native Americans, what does it mean? That they are part of nature or what I mean. So, uh, <laughs> were so fascinated by it that they offered him $10 million, one reservation, which was lucky with the casino. So, they immediately recognized me that it's not this white patronizing. It's uh, okay. Uh, whatever I, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's clear that uh, it's simple. In a Wyoming reservation in the north of the United States, they found a dead girl. They find the body of a dead girl who was raped and running for miles in the snow in midwinter. Then the hero, a hunter, white guy, that protecting white animals in the reservation collaborates with the relatively honest good FBI girl to solve the problem. And uh, you will just see, don't be afraid, the final scene where uh, he comes to the father of the killed girl, the hero, and he also will learn that his daughter was also killed three years ago in a similar way. And just tells him that he found the murderer, and so on, and so on. And it's a beautiful thing because he comes to the house of the father in total distress, and he finds the father painted with some weird blue and white colors. And ask, listen, I hope it will be understandable. I'm very sorry that the only copy that I was 
able to get it pirated, of course. Some I even don't know, are they Chinese, Korean, or Japanese? <laughs> it's a wonderful, so short, simple dialogue. Because the guy, the Indian in morning, says simply, I have my death face on. And the hero asks him, but how did you learn? How do you know? And he says, I don't know, there is nobody to talk me, to teach me how to do it. I just invented it myself, you know. <laughs> and then uh, the, uh, uh, the guy said, but I have some good news. My son, who was a delinquent, it shows the desperation on the reservation, uh, is called me, he was released from prison, and then he says, as soon as I will wash off my face this stupid paint, I will go and fetch him up, but I must stay a little bit here just to sit down in silence to, as an act of mourning for my daughter. And in a beautiful line of friendship, he, the Indian in mourning, says to the hero, do you also have some time to, to sit here? And the hero says, yes, and they just sit down. You know why I like this? Because, uh, be, listen to it carefully. When? the Native American Indian, father of the killed girl, when he says, uh, uh, I wash this, as soon as I wash this stupid color from my face, uh, it doesn't mean it's bullshit because I no longer am able to do it in the authentic old way. Like if there would be my, if my tribal tradition were to be still, uh, blah, 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 I think it's a much more refined position. In this way, by saying this, he fully recognizes himself as already a modern subject. He knows all this is bullshit. You know, like, ah, this stupid face. But, and that's the, this, uh, maybe you strip reversal. So, he goes to the end in getting rid of these traditional rituals. But nonetheless, although you are aware that they are pure nonsense, in a beautiful way, you can see how the ritual, as an empty ritual, you don't have to believe in anything. The ritual survives. But it's a ritual with no blotting of, you know, all that stuff which I suspect some of my Native American friends told me that. When we say, oh, this is our ancient wisdom, beware. We are speaking for stupid tourists here, <laughs> new majors, you know. The, this is the, how you go to the end in process of secularization, you know all this is bullshit, but maybe only at that point. And this is what you get at the end of this year. You not only in some pseudo-dialectical sense, pseudo-religious, nonetheless you discover that you need a ritual or whatever, but in a way, you discover in this minimal form where you don't have to believe in anything, none of the bullshit, the value of ritual in its empty form at, at, at its purest. And here, I'm not bluffing now. You remember when I made fun with you, some stupid yeah. the tribes? Mm -hmm. Maybe they can do this. Oh, this would be, yeah, that, you know, they are not stupid. It's not, fuck it, I always laugh when they tell me what we have. These are the tourist Indians, you know, like. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them, I read somewhere, are not even authentically Native Americans, you know. <laughs> They just know that you can earn money by uh, <laughs> visiting white people and playing from their guild, but we have our own holistic wisdom and so on, you know. <laughs> Every authentic Indian Native American laughs at it, you know. But what interests me is how, again, in this totally empty way, no belief in it, the ritual survives. So let's do it, and again, I will do my usual totally illegal uh, propaganda. Uh, uh, you can uh, download, <laughs> no, you can uh, download whatever, let's go directly there, ah yeah, here we are, a little bit back, this is just, uh, this is, the hero, his daughter was always, also killed, now he visits the house, is there maybe just a way audio control to make volume, you make it a little bit more loud, it's there, 
Let's hope, yeah. Chips called me in over here. She beats you stuck with him. Where is it? Station. It's gonna go pick her mother. As soon as the horse is a shit on the face. <laughs> Why I missed it or it just struck to the end, there is a feature here that I really don't like. Because at the end, if you show the movie, there is a, there are a couple of lines like which is statistically true that for all other ethnic groups in the United States, you have uh, statistics how many girls go missing per year. For Native American girls, they, you don't get any statistics. It would have been very easy to get her, but the rate is so high that, I mean, are we aware here, I get, although me and political correctness, when, when God, Platonic God created the world, he put it that the idea of me and the idea of political correctness don't overlap, you know. But nonetheless, here I recognize the horror. You know that, like, I think, let me mention this example. For example, my Canadian friend gave it to me. There is a Native American... I see more Inuit than uh, Indian city of 2000, way north. You know how many inhabitants of that city killed themselves in last half a year of 2000? Over 100. Like this is really a society even now in total disintegration and so on. So, but to get back uh, to this uh, point, uh, you, see, you see what I simply... My point, the Medius, Medius strip point, is this precisely when you bring secularization to the end. 
this, I know that what, what expression when I wash the sheet of my face or whatever, like the point is not, not none of this enthusiasm, I take the ritual seriously and so on, you are deprived of all tradition. If anyone here is the Native American with, with his colored face who is the pure modern subject, and as such, you need this minimal ritual. You know who also invented this ritual? I don't have the time to go into it, but did you see a wonderful, nice movie? I like it, very optimistic movie, and I don't mean it as a bad joke. Lars von Trier's uh, Melancholia. You know, also when at the end, when the girl Kirsten Dunst proposes that tent-like structure, it's totally wrong to put into it some kind of magic value, this will protect us, and so on and so on. No, it's just the pure minimal gesture of, of constructing some space there. That's all, pure formal, pure, pure formal gesture. And, uh, okay, we can go on here, but again, my point is simply, and this is the minimum of maybe you strip how you have two lines, let's call it modern empty subject and ritual. We usually associate rituals with uh, traditional subjectivity where, as we say in our European racist way, those primitives, even if we praise them, uh, they don't yet know the notion of modern individualism, they are deeply embedded in their stupid traditions, whatever. No, but again, the, 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 true, the true modernity, again, the truly modern subject is that the Native American father. He does a truly modern ritual, this minimal form of ritual. How, if you go to the end of modernity, ritual returns, but ritual returns at its purest. And the big mistake would have been to dismiss this as, oh, you see, we didn't yet get rid of the ritual, we have to work more to get rid of it. No. That ritual, minimal ritual, sustains uh, modernity. But let me go back to my main line. So what I will try to develop, and again, if I talk too much, I will, uh, I will through medicine, I will uh, keep to my old rule, which means I will send you a text, so that even if I get lost here, you will get the stuff. And it will be really unpublished stuff mostly because it's the stuff of many groups. Okay, I want to say this then. To translate it directly into Lacanian terms, what Lacan calls Juan de Capiton, the twisting point, where the two levels mix in a point, this would be, uh, this would be Mebius strip. You go on one side, you find yourself at the opposite side. This simple reversal. Cross cap is what I'm tempted to call uh, uh, not, not quilting point, but the quilting line. It's the line, you remember, when the strange ball gets together, you have the cut, the line. And this is, for me, either sexual difference or class struggle or whatever you want, kind of a cut which helps it apart, but at the same time helps together a society. And then the last one, most interesting line bottle, this strange twisted line where from outside you find yourself inside, all of a sudden looking at the wall of the cave. This would have been, sorry, this would have been, I call it the quilting tube or whatever. And I will try again to develop much more in detail uh, how this how this uh, uh, how this works? Okay. Uh, uh, maybe we should simply begin with uh, the underlying ontological structure, which is, to put it very simply, uh, that of the Hegelian reversal of. Uh, as Hegel puts it apparently in, a, apparently in an idealist way that the development of spirit is a closed circle where things just become what they are. Usually this is read in a totally 
wrong teleological way, it means nothing new in the world, everything is implicitly already there, and reality is just the deployment, the actualization of what things already are potentially in themselves. So this is usual reproach to Hegel. Nothing really new can happen. Actuality is a closed circle. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, if we, that's my point, if we read Hegel closely, we can see that this, what Hegel means by things, become what they are. It's not things become what they already are, but in a much more literal way. Things become what they are. What you are is not fixed in advance, but in a retroactive process, in an, only pro in an open process, which might have turned differently. You become what retroactively it will appear that you always already were. For example, I'm sorry for using old examples. When Caesar crossed Rubicon, he became what he was. But he was not really before crossing. Before crossing Rubicon, he was who knows what. He might have turned back to Gaul, back to France today, and just be another warlord there or whatever. But at, uh, oh, my usual example, you know, by falling in love, you become what you are. Because when you fall in love or have another achievement, you have this feeling, now I fully am what I am. But the process is open. It's a kind of a abyssal circle. You're trying to catch yourself and never catch yourself. There is a gap, a hole in this circularity. This is still the simple circle of Matthew Strip. And precisely, you pass to the other side and so on, but it's clear that there is some cup, some hole in it, which propels the circle. The other one, the cross cap is, uh, we will develop it later, it's a redoubled circle where things are even more interesting in the sense that in this type of a redoubled circle, uh, it's not that things uh, just become what they are, it's that here the cut, the line, is explicitly posited. It's an impossible difference. By this I mean what? Let's take a sexual difference. Uh, partisans of this fluidity of gender positions and so on like to claim that we cannot cut a clear difference of the two sexes. You know, men, we men are all a little bit women, women a little bit men, it's all fluid and so on and so on. Of course, the, what is impossible is not to define a clear difference. Or rather, what is impossible is precisely to translate into firm, symbolic determinations, difference. Difference is here absolutely but impossible. A kind of a point of reference which cannot be clearly defined but casts its shadow on all of it. This is why, for example, uh, this is why, as I develop in my books, uh, for me, transgender people are different at its purest. Because that's the paradox, I hope you will get it. That's how I read cross campus. You know, we have a total field of sexuality. But then we have that strange line which makes this totally disharmonious. And there is a cut. But it's an impossible cut, in the sense that you cannot even clearly define it. What, what, uh, so against this accusation of binary logic and so on, what Lacan means by sexual difference is precisely that it's a kind of an obstacle cut which you cannot clearly define. Sexual difference means precisely for Lacan that at the phenomenal level of our self-experience, you cannot say, I am purely man, I am purely woman, and so on. All the wealth of sexuality cannot be 
squeezed into these two couples. You are either a man or a woman. There's always, there is always some excess, which precisely bears witness to the fact that the difference, the cut, is real. And the same, I don't have time to go into it now, but the same helps also for, uh, for uh, class struggle, although the logic is, of course, is not the same. It's that uh, class struggle does not mean, this is vulgar Marxism, there are ultimately just two classes, and ultimately you are here or there. No, class struggle in its phenomenal social practice means precisely there are never only two classes. Because if the moment you could have said this is the basic class difference, you're either here or there, it's no longer class struggle. It's just a harmonious, even if it's struggle all the time, it's just a harmonious division, you're either here or there. Class struggle does not mean only we fight. It means precisely that it's not clear, as it were, it's not clear where you are. You all the time borrow from the opponent, you can be here, you can be there, and so on, and so on. Uh, which is why, again, class struggle means precisely that there is always, in the same way as transgender, that there is always some, uh, some we can call them whatever, rebel or, 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 um, or uh, subproletarians or whatever you want. There is always or petit bourgeois, there are always some who do not fit it. You cannot define it in a clear social way. And I will develop this in the manuscript, a nice example, which uh, I developed in, I forgot which one of my books, maybe it's uh, uh, living in, in the, the end of time, uh, of uh, the problems that, for example, it's a beautiful problem, I'm sorry if you know it, in, Soviet Union in early 1930s, when they were doing the decolonization, they wanted to do it in an objective way. They wanted to define precisely the class criterion. First, it was, it was ridiculous. If you have, I don't know, more than five cows and if you exploit uh, 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 more than five other paid workers, you are a kulak. No? <laughs> then, then it got more and more complex, among other things also because in the chaos of decolonization, farmers got poorer and poorer. So at the end, although already one cow or one goat meant you were there. But uh, what I like so much is that then, uh, so they endlessly complicated the classification. They wanted clearly to define where you are. At the end, they ended and <coughs> sorry, with introducing a category of sub, like sub proletarian, sub kulak. And they tried to define it in the sense that uh, you have a, just one cow or whatever, minimal. But if you look at closely, what really meant is objectively, we don't know what you are but subjectively we think you are a danger. You know, basically it meant that uh, subjectivity intervened. Basically it was a concession that you cannot define who is the kulak in an objective social way, economic category. That uh, subjectivity emerges again. So again, back to uh, Back to, uh, back to sexuality, I underline it. That's my only misunderstanding and reproach to LGBT, to repeat it again. First, I think they are absolutely, in a good sense, subversive, but not in the sense they think. The big difference is the last time when I was here, I think it was uh, Jacqueline Rose, okay, to insult her, Jackie Rose, you know, because to be. Ah, she is there! Oh, no, Esther just... Ah, yeah, okay, she will report it. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, uh, that... Uh, uh, the opposite, class struggle in, uh, in LGBT for me is this one. Either you think, in a pseudo Deleuzean way, that there is some original plurality of positions, and then that Oedipus enters and sexual difference uh, totalizes the entire field, 
so that then the goal becomes just to expand the categorization, you know, instead of two sexes you have, I don't know, in New York City, the Federal Committee which decided there are, I think, 31 or 32 or whatever, and then that's the illusion. Each of us will have, like, I am a, I am a lesbian butch or whatever, each of us will have a category and we will be satisfied. Or my much more pessimist reason that sexuality as such is an embarrassment. Your difference. And, and uh, like, uh, the point is precisely that uh, you will never find your place by definition. The moment you will be able to find your place, I am this, I am that, it's no longer sexuality. It, it, the same, again, the same, the same with class struggle. It's always an ambiguity. Read Lenin if you don't believe me. Uh, Lenin, you will think, the toughest class struggle guy. But you know, in his last years, when Soviet Union tried to open a little bit towards uh, 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 trade with capitalist countries, Lenin was absolutely fascinated by big, efficient capitalists. Some Americans visited him. And he claimed that they are somewhere in between. Although they are at the top of capitalism, they are almost already running enterprises because they are so big as public property and so on and so on. You see, this is class struggle. That it, like, I put it like this. It's not a categorization. It's not that you have a social structure, we are here, you are there. It's a kind of antagonism which cuts across. We have bourgeois elements in the working class, we have proletarian elements in the ruling class when it gets highly developed. They almost work like uh, representatives of uh, some kind of twisted communist dimension is there and so on and so on. Uh, so this would be for me uh, the cross cap and the interest of Klein Bottle would be that I think it's the best, of course, imagined presentation of subjectivity, of how uh, I will even try to do it now I'm reading books trying to bluff my way into it, uh, quantum physics. Uh, you know, it's so interesting. Now it's reading, if you understand. I don't, but what I mean is that it's so tense because now quantum physicists are dropping the, let's call it Copenhagen orthodoxy, and with revenge, the ontological question is emerging. And it's incredible what type of paradoxes you get. One line, the old Copenhagen, the problem is this one. You know the story. We have these ordinary particles, our everyday life, when we measure things. And then we have this proto-virtual space of uh, 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 whatever you call it, uh, um, wave oscillations, phi, this quantum reality, so-called. Okay, what is the status of this quantum reality? with regard to the reality of ordinary objects in our reality. The radically, let's call it agnostic, Copenhagen orthodoxy is ultimately no status at all, it's just epistemological, like what really exists are our measurements. You measure this, this type of, uh, I don't know what, electrons and so on, when they pop up, and there. And quantum waves, quantum reality, is just, uh, in my mind, it's the way complicated calculation that we try to account for, calculate the process probabilities of passing from one to another measurement, but it's meaningless to ask the ontological question. Now, what is so interesting is that the latest trend, and it got a big boost now with the latest uh, Nobel Prize, you know, about gravitational waves and so on. If we will have time, we read it. It's so fascinating. It's the opposite one. It's that not only quantum waves exist, but they are ultimately the only thing that exists that uh, our temporal reality is just the result of the limitation of our knowledge. Like, 
we cannot observe individual photons or whatever, we get statis statistical average. And this is how space, time, and so on emerge. Okay, I don't want to go into it too much. What I'm saying is that here we get exactly the opposite version. This uh, wave, fluctu uh, uh, wave, uh, wave fluctuation, gravitational waves, and so on, and they arrive at beautiful results. The, the basic result, I don't know if it's true, but all I can say honestly is it sounds nice. <laughs> is, that, uh, is that time and space are not uh, infinitely, what do you call it, divisible. That there are also quanta of time and space. In this sense, incidentally, you can triumphantly resolve that Zeno's stupid paradox. You know? <laughs> Achilles cannot ever reach the, you know, because uh, you can infinitely divide it. To get here, the, the, the turtle will progress. No, yes, this presupposes infinite divisibility. No, always. No, but the idea is, and they can even define it, there is a minimum of quantum in. There is a quantum minimum of space. You get, you know, you have an absolute limit of space. And also you have a minimum quantum of time. Time is not continuous. It's like precisely quanta, minimal elements. Now, why I like this so much? Because as all materialists are, I was deeply disturbed by all the uh, Big Bang bullshit. Because, you know, that's where priests come, you know. Oh, but at that point of absolute density, uh, God intervened and so on. No, if you accept this quanta character of time and space, you can demonstrate that Big, big Bang at its radical never existed. You get close to that, but you encounter a certain limit, in, so you can mathematically prove that. Before Big Bang, that, that has to be, there had to be a black hole, so now they talk about Big Bounce or whatever, you know. <laughs> it almost condensed, when it reached the quantum limit, it exploded again. So it's out, that idea. It's so nice, they have a perfect, funny answer to this theological reading that Big Bang means like, the, let there be light, God says, no? And they say that if you want to be correct, you should rather have God to say, oh, let me turn the light on again. <laughs> because it's always a, a big bounce. So it's extremely... In but what I wanted to say is that here you have the opposite vision. Again, reality is quantum reality, and there are wonderful things there. I just don't know, I'm sorry for my stupidity, how serious scientifically they are. But again, I'm sorry. It sounds nice, no? No, the idea that the moment you accept this, you have to posit a level at which time and space are no longer these Kantian formal empty containers. So that things happen in time and space. No, time becomes its own stuff. Like, time is not a form of things happening. At this wave level, Time is not a time in which waves oscillate. Time is just a, a gravitational oscillation and so on. And they develop in a very nice way how we get, although this is always a critical point, how we get from here to our daily notion of time, where time is a frame form within which uh, things uh, happen. But ah, here I'm back at my make you strip. You see the beauty of it. Our ordinary, everyday, in our reality ontology is we have form and content, as Kant put it, but also this is our spontaneous teleology. Time is an a priori form and things happen in time. No, they say if you go to the end, at the level of time, you reach the point where time itself, like on Mabius Street, falls into content. Time is really a temporal object, a certain wave function, which doesn't happen in time, but is time itself as a certain uh, oscillation. 
And then you have wonderful sub-theories. Like one is that there is no time without heat. Why? Because our notion of time is strictly linked to, to entropy and so on, to a system cooling down. Because only the moment you have heat, you have irreversible processes. And if you don't get an irreversible process, like for example, theoretically you can, but de facto you cannot, if I burn this piece of paper, it's irreversible. It's very difficult even to imagine to run it backwards, to, that, to recompose out of the ashes the paper. So the idea is that uh, time only in the sense that we know it, linear global time, the empty container in which things happen, only appears at a certain level of reality which is not the ultimate level. So, back to my opposition, I find this so fascinating how we have two, and then they reproach us philosophers, you are a crazy guy who can claim the opposites, whatever you want. Well, believe me, we are not as crazy as quantum physicists. But really, you can claim again that quantum waves are just our calculation, and more and more popular theory, the exact opposite. And I will not do it now, of course, but I just want to draw your attention to how the big problem for me is precisely uh, how to pass from one level, quantum oscillation outside space and time in our ordinary sense, how the problem is not to penetrate to the original pre-ontological space of these oscillations. The problem is how to come back. The problem is, and this is the big, as they call it in TV quiz shows, one million dollar question, no? How to come back? Why? How to account for the so-called collapse of wave function? Where, you know, our ordinary reality of objects emerges immanently out of quantum processes themselves. Because the problem with older versions of quantum mechanics is that it implies a certain dualism in the sense that we observers are simply here and we measure, we observe. But in some sense, if you are consequent, we observers must be part of the very reality we measure. How to account for this? You probably, some of you know it better than me, that the main candidate is so-called decoherence theory. No? They try to formulate the criteria how this collapse of wave function happens following the imminent necessity of the quantum processes itself, but again, it's not yet resolved the problem. And here comes, okay, but uh, let's do now something, let's move to a little bit more explanation of uh, Mebius strip to give you some, uh, some examples. And there will be just examples from different levels and so on and so on uh, uh, of this mixture, of, of this reversal. Uh, for example, one simple example would have been the reversal of good into evil. What we all liberals, as we are, like to point out is how, if you follow the path of religious fundamentalism, then with extreme obsession with good, I think my religion tells the truth, good, then your extreme good, too much good, turns into evil. In this liberal pluralist vision, evil is good to self if you get too much of it, if you absolutize it, and so on. I claim my religion is the only true one, and so on, and so on. I end up killing all the others, and so on, and so on. Well, this is some kind of example, but I find much more attractive the opposite example. That evil itself, if you progress on the side of evil, it can turn into good. In the sense, not, I'm not uh, trying to sell you any cheap, uh, any, any cheap paradoxes. I'm just trying to uh, give you the example of, for example, take, sorry, well-known example, take Jesus Christ. I can well understand that from the standpoint of Jewish establishment, 
he was in a way evil incarnated. His existence and so on meant denying Jewish tradition, Jewish hierarchy, and so on and so on. But, you know, then the key reversal happens when evil itself brought to the end, when it becomes ruling principle, defines good. But I would like to give you another example which I use in one of my books, beautiful one of this. Remember again, maybe you speak two lines, how they are intertwined and so on. Uh, in uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuy relies on this classical book, Louis de Monk, Homo Hierarchicus, where he claimed that how are always social structures, hierarchies, function? It's not only that you have higher level ruling class and lower level the subordinated, but that it's a condition of power that you have higher and lower level, but within the lower level, the lower is higher than the higher. What do I mean by this? this you find this line from ancient India to from ancient India to Martin Luther. The problem is this one. We have two worlds. Let's say the sacred world and our secular world. Or, in the terms of power, religious power and secular power. Okay, in principle, of course, religious power is highest. My God, it deals with God and so on. But, as Luther emphasized, of course, religious power is higher than secular power. But within the secular power, once you're within the secular power, secular power should rule over religious power. You have to turn it around. This mean, meant for Luther, of course. God is higher than social order, but within a secular social order, a local prince, political power, should have higher authority than uh, than the sacred, uh, and so on and so on. So, uh, 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 so uh, here we also can have, again, this dialectic of good and evil. Good divine domain versus the terrestrial sphere of power struggles, egotistical interests, search for pleasure, and so on, and so on. Uh, in a uh, in traditional view of religion, you can say that we are dealing here with what Hegel called cunning of reason. That the, high, the higher power, divinity or historical reason uses our lower egotistic instincts to, to realize itself. Like, you know, this is pseudo, I claim, but nonetheless it appears to be Hegel's vision. That of course history is full of egotistic passions and so on, but these egotistic passions are just instruments used by good, by historical reason to realize a goal. As Hegel said, nothing great in history was achieved without passion. But uh, so the point is not to condemn egotist passions. Of course, Caesar was acting out of egotist motives. Caesar is not thinking, oh my God, I have to fulfill my historical mission and so on, but I want wealth, power and so on. But in this sense, he contributed to history and Hegel even goes as far as, in a very cynical way, enumerates examples from which it's clear that, that uh, those rulers who were not egotistic usually meant total ruin, a catastrophe. But, uh, I think that uh, uh, it, in a, at, a, at a deeper level, it's also the opposite, which is a much more profound Hegelian category. It's not that the good supremely reigns and uses evil as its means, like there is some divine plan, the good, which organizes history so that we do whatever we want, follow our evil motives, but they serve the good. What if we accept the opposite view, which is that 
Out of the struggle of evil particular motives, good is precisely the winning side. Something that good is a process of self-differentiation of evil. In the sense that, again, in the, in the, in the sense that what we think good is the way that a particular evil universalizes, legitimizes itself, but let's not, uh, uh, let's not maybe lose time with it. I want to give you another example from this, of this uh, reversal of content and form. Because one big couple where maybe you strip function is content and form. You know, like, you have certain content, something happens in a certain form. And the maybe you strip reversal is the point where form itself falls into content. If you listen carefully, you saw how I tried to, I didn't explain it because it's too abstract, to hint at it apropos quantum physics, how the ultimate speculative point of this gravitational, gravitational wave theory is that quantum waves is that uh, uh, form itself becomes content. Form, temporal form, which, in which changes, waves oscillate, is disclosed to be just another more fundamental wave. Uh, let me give you a different example. I'm just trying to illustrate to you this Matthew Strip reversal. Uh, in a wonderful dream, wonderful interpretation of dream, Freud quotes a woman who uh, presented, didn't want to report to Freud a certain dream. She claimed that the dream is so indistinct and muddled that she doesn't remember it clearly and so on and so on. But then it became clear that uh, the woman was, I'm not criticizing her, very, very promiscuous, and the true content of the dream was, I screwed around a lot, and it's uh, uh, indistinct and muddled, muddled, she was pregnant, who the father of my child is. And what Freud uh, does in a wonderful property Hegelian way is, he reads this formal feature, of the dream. The woman complaining, oh, it's muddled, indistinct, I don't know what's happening, as a direct inscription of the repressed content. You see the beauty. The woman didn't want to confront the true problem. Even in the dream she was, sorry for using this stupid term, afraid to directly raise this question. Who is the father of my child? And I love this I mean, you know all those stupid, they are now already out of fashion jokes about stupid blondines, you know. But I think some of their jokes, I think they are very intelligent, they are Hegelian. Did you hear it? You know, it's my favorite blondine joke. That a doctor tells her uh, that she is pregnant, no? You must know it, what she answers. Are you sure that the child is mine, you know? <laughs> That's the Hegelian moment, if you want, you know. But okay, let's go share that. You know that something that is excluded from the content returns in a form, returns as a form. So again, a purely formal feature, the dream is muddled indistinct, is a return of what is repressed from the content. So you see where, so we don't have a simple duality. We have content, we have form, and the content is too wealthy, cannot fully express itself in the form. That's the simple version, you know, or even the mystical one, you know, like, oh, there is so much I want to say, I cannot fully express it, and so on and so on. No, Freud's here, and Hegel's view is much more dialectical, refined. It's that, no, there is a content is never simply a content in itself. There is something primordially repressed in the content itself. And this repressed returns in the form. So, that's the nice paradox. If you want to get 
in a dream or in any ex work of art which tries to express something. If you want to get all of content, it's wrong to say, oh, the form is enough, I have to look deeper. No, you have to include form in the content itself. I hope I'm clear here, this, uh, uh, how does it work, this uh, Matthew Street reversal. And it's, again, it's the same with the dream of Freud. The content of the dream, to get a deep, you have to include the purely formal element of the dream is indistinct, uh, muddled, and so on. This is the only trace left of the fact of what, uh, of what the dream is about. And maybe you remember in my, uh, in my books I give here a whole series of standard examples. For example, in melodramas, often you have a story which is too pathetic to stage it. And this, so it would have been ridiculous. But this pathetic excess then returns in the form, in a too pathetic music and so on and so on. Again, the secret of, it's not only that content is too mysterious, form cannot penetrate it. No, on, no, content is blocked, thwarted in itself. And to get at all of content, you need to include the form. You know who also did this in a, back to my beloved, although now he's half crazy, I heard, uh, Lars von Trier. Did you see his uh, Breaking the Waves? Uh, it's not my favorite movie. I'm a primitive revenge feminist. I like, what is that one with Nicole Kidman? No, the first one. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, isn't it? Sorry, I'm so low. But don't you like the last ten minutes when she takes revenge and kills them? So I'm, you don't like it. I love it. Yes, I'm against this. No, it's sublime not to take revenge. Fuck it, I want revenge. Oh, <laughs> no, you know. No, but let's go on. So it's great to see Kidman doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Let's go on with uh, this. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so uh, content. Yes. So, last uh, 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 three. Yes. He gives himself a wonderful reading of breaking the waves, where the story is ultra pathetic, but it's shot in a pseudo documentary way handheld camera, clumsy cuts, and he says, if I were to, to shoot a movie directly in a way that would fit its form, it would collapse, it would appear ridiculous. So the only way to sell that story is to oppose form to it, to do the counter form. Again, you see my point, again, it's not the usual hermeneutic triad, form, content, and behind the content, some more mystical inner content. No, behind the content is the forum itself. There is more in the forum than in the content. My uh, okay, uh, my <laughs> final example, and then I give some time for debate, would be, of course, what I repeat. I'm sorry. Now I warning. I will repeat some old jokes. <laughs> of course, uh, 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 that of. The two lines, signifier and signified. The whole point of point, the, what Lacan calls the quilting point, one the capiton, is that at a certain point, signifier has to fall into the signified. The way, I, I mean, I'm embarrassed to do it. I use these examples, uh, uh, I don't know how many times, okay, just Permit me, you've heard it ten times, okay, you will hear, hear it the eleventh time. You know my favorite jokes from Eastern Europe, that Polish one, you know. What is socialism? The idea is the high result of all that is highest in the history of humanity, you know. Socialism is a synthesis of uh, first societies, ancient Greek, medieval times, capitalism, you no? Know? The joke goes like this. Socialism took from primitive societies their barbarism, from, uh, from uh, ancient Greece slavery, from medieval times 
uh, 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 domination, from capitalism exploitation, and now comes the beauty, you know it, from socialism the name. <laughs> but you, get the point. you have to include uh, the name in it, and it's the same with anti-Semitism. It's clear that the Jew is this kind of composite picture. The, of course, I'm talking about anti-Semitic figure of the Jew. They took exploitation from rich bankers. They took the, the fact that they don't wash, so they say, from poor people, blah, blah. And at the end, they took from the Jews the name, anti-Semitism. You see, and I think that this dialectic is in every name. When you have to, and this is what I think Saul Kripke, he tragically disappeared, no, was after, in his naming and necessity, when he introduced this strict notion of a rigid designator, that simply a name never just names a thing. Ultimately, a thing becomes a thing by adding a name to it. In this sense, signifier, a name, has to fall into the signified. There must be this maybe strict short circuit. If you pursue to the end the line of signifiers, okay, up to a certain point signified is on the other side, but then you change sides, you encounter yourself among the signifiers. Not to mention Hegel, I was telling this to you dozens of times, how for Hegel, that's why for Hegel, a species is always, if we oppose, sorry, a species or a genus and its species, a genus, universality, is always included as one among its species. And in a very dialectical way, for example, uh, the point is to, Marx was aware of this, you remember the classic I often quote the passage from Introduction to Grundrisse, where Marx develops how in every capitalist, in every mode of production, one specific domain of production embodies production as such. Like, in medieval times, it was agricultural production, which colored them all, so that even artisanship, others were organized like agriculture. In capitalism, it's industrial production, so that even agriculture is organized like... You know. So, in other words, what Marx is saying is that we don't have universal genus and its species. It's again the Mebius structure where genus has to appear as one of its species. And this is what Hegel calls coincidence of opposite. Just this reversal. It's not that stupidity of, oh, opposites coincide, because we have many other ways of uh, coinciding opposites. We have this mystical theological. God is so sublime that he is at the same time exists, doesn't exist, good, evil, or our finite oppositions coincide there. That's not Hegel. We have another version which is Maoist, pseudo-Maoist, rather primitive, which is that what is life but in eternal struggle of opposites, light and darkness, masculine, feminine, whatever you want. No, that's also not it. Again, what Hegel means by coincidence of opposites is maybe strip. It's this simple reversal. But then it gets complicated now, the concluding bad joke, not of sin, don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, uh, the best way to explain next point Cross cap is, don't laugh, it's a shitty movie, but I like the story, you don't kill me, don't prohibit me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Stephen King, not the last one, it, but Dark Tower. Dark Tower is the clearest, uh, because, you know, you have two realities, our world and that, have the Western world, and Dark Tower is the line which connects them. That's why they want to... It's, uh, as usual with Stephen King, don't misunderestimate him, you know. He's an interesting author, in spite of all. Okay, <laughs> let me stop, and next time... But again, if you do not come to the end again, although I don't know which of you, there is one of you whose ball I want to cut, and then eat them with parsley and garlic. <laughs> you know what? Because maybe it's not even new, I did the same in Seoul, Korea. 
because I talked too much and wasn't able to give, I said, okay, I give you my future manuscript. Fuck you, I saw it two weeks afterwards on, on internet. Please don't do this to me because then I get problems with my publishers and so on. <laughs> but I have it all from my forthcoming book, not the one which will be out now, it already is Incontinence of the Void, but maybe Alenka is it already disponible. It's an excellent book by Alenka Zupantri, What is Sex? In the United States it's already on the market and it's doing very well. And... No, no, we are now exploding. I mean, now we will really be Troika, not just me. Because Mladen Dolar will publish soon my other good Lacanian friend with uh, Bloomsbury. We ironically refer to it as his agree. Six, seven hundred pages. Oh, wow. A big book. So now we are on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa is so busy. Sorry, Lisa Thompson does wish she's so busy. Yeah, but I like her, Lisa Thompson, my publisher. She's great because she is this kind of, a, I mean, this as extreme celebration of her. This naughty, dirty Irish girl, all, always for my bad taste jokes. You know, okay. Very naughty. Very good. Okay, let's stop it. So, again. In two days from now, I will try to condense a uh, cross cut, the structure of impossible difference, which is like a redouble, two circles, major street, and then the trick of this Klein Bocker, which again is extremely interesting. How, you know, you just, con it's a more complex uh, Mebius street. You fall in and you are outside and just continuing you look at it from the inside. What's the meaning of this, especially the political view? Now we still have a little bit of time, so if you little, want to... Little time, so ten minutes. Perhaps if we uh, uh, take together some uh, two or three questions, uh, we can deal with them in the next ten minutes. Do you know, but maybe I can ask you, okay. do you know, sorry, immediately, do you know any of good move? I think that Wind River is almost it is an interesting story, but the movie is a little bit boring. Are there any good movies? Not now. Not now. Just, just wait. Blade Runner is just... Around the corner. It's tomorrow, it's no? Tomorrow. Let's go. Let's go. see. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Thank you. Um, a word that cropped up a few times was opposite. Sorry? A word that cropped up a few times in your presentation was the word opposite. Yes. But when I see that Mobius strip, yeah. there's actually a visual extinguishment of the opposite. You start with two sides and you end up with one. And I'm wondering whether what, what, you, what you take opposite to, to mean, is it an observation of a process? Yeah. Or is it one thing and another thing? So there's a, there's a Jungian term you might be familiar with, an antiodroma, which yeah. is the idea of if you take a as a process, a force, yeah. and you push from one position to a counter position, that's exactly where you end up, so that you know, the, sort of the snake eats, the yeah, yeah. eats its tail. And so I'm, I'm wondering if I could just quiz you a bit about what you have in mind when you use the word opposite, and is it this observation of a process, or is it actually one thing and another? Uh, it's of course, in a Hegelian way, I think that what you call process is in a way inscribed into the thing itself. Because I claim that the, okay, opposition, simply, the two sides are not simply cancelled. The process goes on indefinitely. They remain two sides. In the same way that, okay, the last example I give you, language. Okay, at a certain point, signifier has to fall into the signifier to guarantee the unity. But they are nonetheless still, still distinguished. So I, what interests me is that what, what there must be some kind of a cut, cut or gap which is present there implicitly in a way. You know what I mean? It's not just that instead of two sides you get, okay, you get one side, but this side is nonetheless in a way its own opposite. Because remember, you say you get to the same point but on the other side of the track. Because you begin here, then you come back, it twists around to the same point, but on the other side. So the problem with maybe strip is precisely 
that uh, it blurs the line of opposition, which remains here. And I try to read it in this maybe a little bit primitive uh, Hegelian way that cross cap is then, if I may put it in these speculative terms, the truth of the Medius strip. Because there you get the clear gap in, in cross cap. No? And I've been trying to develop this with further elements, but you did hit the, the crucial point. How no, the mystery is that although you arrive at the same point, two sides are not really two, but this doesn't abolish the tension, if I may put it like this. No, it makes the confusion, the tension even even stronger in a way. That that would be my point. Sorry, yeah. Do you think it's really possible for the transsexual subject to avoid castration anxiety? It all depends with what do you mean uh, castration. I mean, if you read in this very basic Lacanian sense, then I think not only they don't avoid it, they confront it at its purest. It's ordinary male of feminine position which tries much more to avoid castration. Because you avoid castration precisely. Because, you know, castration is not I'm here, a man, you are there, woman, we are clearly delimitated. This is precisely, in strict Lacanian sense, the, uh, the avoidance of castration. Castration means that by, it's a very nice, again, maybe a strip, speculative uh, remark on Hegel, which was taken over, although he was anti hegelian by our deceased friend, Ernesto Laclau, where he says that the basic paradox of his logic of hegemony is that external difference is always at the same time internal difference. And in this sense, sexual difference is not simply, I'm here, you are there, and it's not this simple differentiality in the sense that Man defines woman, woman defines man, but simply an opposite. Like, in the same way, you cannot define left without right. No. You cannot define man without woman. No, no, no. Castration means that by way of being differentiated from a woman, I lose myself. I, at the same time, lose a part of myself. The, the, or to put it in more simple, but nonetheless speculative terms, the paradox of castration is not cut into two and each of us loses a part. I lose my feminine part, you lose your masculine part, whatever. No, that's bullshit. The point is that precisely that when you get sexual difference, if you put the two parts together, you don't get the whole. Because that's precisely the ideological fantasy. Men, women alone, they don't work, and we should have some kind of unification, masculine, feminine principle, harmoniously collaborating. That, and make the worst male chauvinists know this very well. Because uh, even Goethe knew this, that the next streak of male chauvinism is to always admit that great male heroes always have a kind of a feminine power that sustains them, you know. And even Nazis like to play this game, by the way, you know. Like, the true male chauvinism is not, screw women, I am a man. But it's that there is a noble, creative, caring side of femininity, and precisely in my most brutal male assertive position, I am sustained by that uh, femininity. So, to go back to your point, I think that it may sound a speculative sophistical solution, but I would have said that transgender people, in a way, experience castration at its purest without being either men or women, at its most radical, you know. Men, with the loss that sustains them both, transgender people come <coughs> closest to it. No, I'm not, now I know what's the danger here. The danger is, I'm well aware of it, that in this way, I celebrate them in a false way. Yes, you are authentic, but then, fuck you, you are condemned to suffer all the time, to be the suffering part. No, it's not necessary. I'm not claiming because they are the moment of truth, they must suffer some ultra-anxiety and so on. That's the beauty. 
Uh, I think that this is the greatness of Lacan. In one of my early books, I tried to read it for a provocation, of course. When I was looking for progressive Hollywood, no? I used as an example, don't laugh please, Da Vinci Code, you know? <laughs> but what did I do? I did not uh, uh, forget about all that bullshit, you know, uh, Jesus Christ and so on, no? You know what I like about the denouement of the novel? That, uh, obviously, you can also read a novel as a psychological case of the girl, Sophie, being, in her fantasy, the daughter of, grand-grand-granddaughter of Jesus Christ, cannot enter a sexual relationship. And at the end of the novel, the solution is not, oh, now she found Robert Langdon, a guy, incidentally, if I were to be a woman, and the only guy would be Robert Langdon, I would prefer to remain. <laughs> what is great about the movie, there is a magical moment, it's very Lacanian is that it doesn't present herself accepting the cheese, the grand-granddaughter, and remaining asexual in the sense of avoiding heterosexuality. I think that the good point of the film is that, and the novel, is that it accepts this as a genuine position. And Lacan explicitly says that, for example, to be a, how do you call it, women priest, a nun, a nun, that to be a nun is in no way a kind of a bad sublimation. You are not fully a woman for that you find. No, it's a totally authentic position, no less authentic than being a heterosexual woman, and so on and so on. So in this sense, I claim you can, uh, as transsexual and so on, you can absolutely construct your identity, if I use the unfortunate term, in a way which will not be just one eternal suffering, you know what I mean. There are miracles possible here. I'm not condemning transsexuals into, into you are the authentic one and you have to suffer all the time or whatever. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure we have time for that. Okay, but we can do a quick one. Um, Stephen and I, I uh, you once made a video where you said that love is evil. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but my question to you is, uh, what is love? Sorry? love what, what is love? I mean, since you're saying that love is, what is love? I mean, surely uh, love is beyond good and evil. I always was very suspicious about this Nietzsche I, I, no, you know what I meant by this? If I may explain very briefly, then we don't take on. Uh, think about falling in love. If by evil we mean, in a very formal way, something which cuts into your social links and brings imbalance, traumatizes you, ruins all harmony, my God, isn't this true or <laughs> Then I'm not kidding. Were you ever absolutely passionately in love? Doesn't this basically almost ruin your entire life? You only think about this, you neglect your friends. It's a very traumatic attachment. I mean, when people claim evil is this one-sided excess, instead of living a harmonious life, you take one thing, you absolutize it. Isn't this love? It, it love, is, love, love is just a connection between people on a basic level, right? Uh, uh, what do you... Yes, but it's a... Strange connection which well, sabotages it itself. Mean, right? no, yeah, but it's not simply a connection among people, it's as a rule a connection among people at the expense of all others. Which is why I think love is much more evil than sexual promiscuity. Yes, okay, let's, uh, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. But let me just say that, uh, 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 you know, as is Lauro Goodson, love must be like uh, freedom for us Chavistas. Uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to go to Latin America and tell everybody that we're ever more free now that we're really fucking. I'm, so, I'm so sad 
that we are not in elementary school where I would with pleasure tell you, till next day there is a homework. <laughs> Each of you should write like two pages of a text like, how did I experience love as evil? <laughs> <laughs> and you get your, your grades for that. Oh, you were really good today. <laughs> but don't explode against him. No, because many people are so opposed to him that I am afraid, I'm a conservative, I'm afraid